Welcome to the Strumman Speaker Series. My name is Barbara Farley. I serve as the Vice President of Academic Affairs and Dean of the College. The purpose of this speaker series is to enrich student and alumni experience by bringing corporate leaders to campus to share their expertise. This was launched about three years ago. This speaker series has proven to be very popular and has attracted executive leaders like today's guest, Chris Killingstad, as well as past guests like Sally Smith, CEO of Buffalo Wild Wings, Douglas Baker, CEO of Ecolab, and Richard Davis, Chairman of US Bank Corp. The Stroman Executive Speaker Series is a collaboration between the Augsburg Office of Corporate Foundation and Government Relations and the Stroman Center for Meaningful Work. I want to offer a special welcome to Bob Stroman, who is here tonight. Bob's parents, Claire and Gladys Stroman, helped to create the Stroman Center for Meaningful Work at Augsburg, and this speaker series is an important expression of their vision. A special welcome, too, to Augsburg's Regents, Dan Anderson is the, the chair of the Finance Committee of the Board, an Augsburg alumnus, and also Regent Karen Durant, who is both an alumna of the college and is vice president and controller of Tenant Company, which is our featured company tonight. Minnesota is a major center of multinational corporate strength in the United States. Many Minnesota companies began in the 19th, 19th century and were based on the natural resources found in this beautiful state. Farming and the lumber industry were tremendously important and became the building blocks for many companies that are still with us today. But society, customer needs, technology, and transportation infrastructure changed and evolved in the 20th century, and the pace of change is still accel accelerating. Companies originally founded on the abundant natural resources in Minnesota were pushed to develop new cost-effective products and methods of delivery to meet a changing market. Those who innovated could survive. Those who did not eventually went out of business. So the question is, how do well-established companies innovate and reinvent themselves? It's easy to say, be innovative, but it's not so easy to do this successfully. Simply changing or launching a new product may not be in itself innovative. Our guest today, Chris Killingstad, president and CEO of Tenant Company, knows what it takes to make innovative change in an established company. Founded in 1870 by George H. Tennant, Tennant Company began as a one-man woodworking business, evolved into a successful wood flooring and wood products company, and eventually into a manufacturer of floor cleaning equipment. Today, Tenant Company remains headquartered in Minneapolis and has annual sales of almost 800 million with 3,000 employees. The company does business in over 80 countries. With a vision to become the world's leader in sustainable cleaning and other technologies, Tenant is creating a culture that celebrates innovation and sustainability. Chris Killingstad has played a pivotal role in Tenant Company's focus on innovation. He joined Tenant in 2002 as Vice President North America and was named President and CEO in 2005. Before joining Tenant, Mr. Killingstad was with the Pillsbury Company for 12 years in several senior management positions, most recently as Senior Vice President and General Manager. Prior to that, he was with Pepsi-Cola International, and was in financial management with General Electric. Born in New York City, Mr. Killingstad has lived in 10 countries during his life. He has a master's degree from Dartmouth College and a bachelor's degree from Colgate University. He served on the Walker Arts Center's Board of Trustees since 2009. Thank you very much for being here this evening. Please join me in welcoming Mr. Chris Killingstad. Thank you, Barbara, for that kind introduction. Thank you to Augsburg College for inviting me. And hello, everybody, and thank you for joining us uh, today. Um, a brief shout out uh, to uh, two of my tenant colleagues who are also Augies, uh, Gretchen and Joni, and they're in the second row here. Um, and a special uh, thank you to Karen Durant, who is an Augie, uh, is on the Board of Regents, uh, is our VP uh, and Corporate Controller, 
and she's the one that uh, recommended uh, that I, I come here and speak uh, today because she thought we had an interesting uh, story. Um, I was also very interested to come and speak here today because I understand that Augsburg has a rich Norwegian heritage, strong links to Norway, and I am actually a first-generation American. My uh, father is Norwegian and my mother is Swedish. They somehow managed to make that holy uh, you know, connection between Swedes and Norwegians work uh, over 50 years uh, of marriage. I've actually lived in Norway and I still speak uh, fluent Norwegian. Um, so I toyed with the idea that uh, given Augsburg's heritage that maybe I should give my talk today in Norwegian with subtitles. You know, give us a little bit of that foreign film uh, feeling and atmosphere. And, uh, and then I thought the better of it and uh, probably much to, to, to your relief. Now, I'm not sure I can live up to the grand title here, but I, I do think I have an interesting story to tell. And I, my presentation really is in two parts. The first part I'm going to talk about um, some of the uh, foundational principles that I think have to be in place if a company or a business is going to be successful. And it's even more important that they're in place if you're trying to reinvent yourself, which Tenet uh, is, is trying to do. So um, with that, let's see, let's get started with the story. Oh, and, and the second part of the story, which I for, just forgot, I'm going to tell the Tenant innovation story. And I'm going to talk about how we applied some of those principles to the journey that we're currently on. And that journey is still very much in the early stages. So Tenant, a 143-year-old company, so young in, uh, or old in age and young in spirit, as you'll see, I think. Uh, started out as a wood products company. Last year we did $754 million in sales, so not all that big yet. We have 2,865 employees around the world, um, and we are traded on the New York Stock Exchange. Really, in the 1940s, tenants started to become known as a non-residential floor maintenance company. And they were credited with the first company to broadly commercialize the first mechanical sweeper, which you see there on the right. Now, obviously, over time, our products have been upgraded and they look a lot better, a little more modern, and we have an expanded portfolio. So today, we do everything from vacuum cleaners that we sell to hotels for 400 bucks, all the way up to sophisticated outdoor street cleaning equipment that clean airport tarmacs. And you may actually see them running around at Minneapolis-St. Paul uh, Airport. We are fond of saying that if it scrubs, sweeps, or vacuums, or any combination of the three, we probably do it. Okay? Now, let's rewind back to 2002 when Tenant approached me about a job. So when they did that, I obviously did some research uh, about the company, and this was my first reaction. This looks totally uninteresting, and I can't imagine a more boring business to be involved in. That was honestly my first reaction. But then I started to study it a little further, and I saw something. For many years, the vision had been, even back then, about creating a cleaner, safer world. I found that compelling. I did some more studying and I said, you know, this is a very interesting company, a leader in its limited space, and it could be so much more. So I decided, you know, my intuition told me that this would be an interesting intellectual and creative challenge. And so I rolled the dice and I joined Tenet. My first week at the company, I started walking around the halls and, you know, as the new guy, and I'm sure I was really popular with this, and I'm saying, you know, there seems to be this disconnect between the vision and what we actually do. Why do we only clean floors? And why don't we do it more sustainably? You know, and people are looking at me like I'm from, from, from Mars. 
But I thought, you know, there is this opportunity. And what I found is people said, you know, it's because that's the way we've always done it, right? It wasn't that they hadn't tried or, 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 and, and failed. It's just that they had never tried to envision something else for the company. The other thing that happened was I went to my first industry trade show about three months after I arrived, and I was horrified. At this trade show, there were at least 80 manufacturers that made cleaning equipment, and all the machines looked exactly alike except for the color. And I said to myself, that is not a good way to ensure the future success of our business because there clearly was no differentiation. So, I went back and I looked at the results of the company financially over the last three years, and they didn't look very good either. So I said, you know, something clearly is wrong, and uh, I think we can make it better. It was time to chart a new direction. Initially, I thought it was all about product innovation, right? If we could bring some new interesting products out, right, and differentiate ourselves from the competition, that would be enough. So, what did I do? I went to the product development organization and I said, listen, show me what you've been working on over the years, okay? I want to see what ideas you have. And I am willing to take the wildest ideas. Matter of fact, the wilder, the better. Because we clearly have to do something completely new and different. So, the engineers, they took me quite literally and they brought me some very interesting ideas of what they had been working on. They were extremely proud of these three. They had been working on the first and the original hot tub. And I said, well, that's pretty interesting. Then they showed me, you know, their work on the first riding lawnmower. And I said, hmm, yeah, well, let's see how we can adapt that to the business. And then, of course, my favorite, the carpool. Now, all of this is obviously tongue-in-cheek, and it's not quite the way it played out. But what was clear at the time was this was not just about product innovation. It became clear that success would require completely new strategies and completely different capabilities going forward. My contention is that there are three foundational principles that you have to have in place if you're going to be successful as a business. And as I said, if you're going to try to reinvent yourself as a business, they're even more important. And it's people, culture, and strategy. My belief is that if you have great people, if you have a culture that's open to change, if you have people who are behaving in entrepreneurial, collaborative, high-performing ways, and you take those great people performing in those high-performing ways, and you focus them against a compelling strategy, more often than not, you will win. What I've learned is that there are many people and many companies that are great at strategic planning. But what they often forget is strategies executed one person, one project at a time within the company's culture. It is said that culture either feeds strategy or worst case, it slowly eats at it. As somebody once said to me, it starts to eat at it and it's like being nibbled to death by ducks. <laughs> right? Because it's slow and it's painful. And so, I'm going to show you a little vignette here that says what happens to a company when there is a disconnect between the people, the culture, and the strategy. All right? Customer comes to company X and they order a product. Marketing is out in front. They listen to the customer and they specify the customer's need this way. Right? So then they hand it over to accounting who prices it like this. 
right? Then the engineers get involved with it and they just said, hmm, based on what we understand, this is the way we need to design it. They hand it over to manufacturing who fabricates it like this. Sales finally gets their hand on it and they start to go out there and install it, install it in all kinds of different ways. What the customer at the end of the day really wanted was this. You may laugh at that, but it happens all the time. When you have well-meaning people who are operating in silos, not connected to each other, and they're not clear what the objective is, more often than not, some variation of this scenario plays out. So, what do you do? Let me talk about people first. I'm going to talk about the second point before I get to the first one, because I think I had these a little bit out of order. But the first, my belief is on the people side, you hire for talent, fit, and attitude. Right? Using a sports analogy, you hire the best athletes. You want people who know how to think strategically. Right? who are somewhat entrepreneurial, who deal well with people, right? who know how to get things done and have a track record of consistently delivering results. You want people who have shown that ability, not in one situation, but across a diverse set of situations, because then you know they're adjust they can adjust and adapt as appropriate. And that's what the world requires. Right. So once you have that talent on board, okay, the second thing is get the right people in the right seats. Right? To use two analogies, one athletic and one musical, right? if you have an orchestra, you have a bunch of great musicians, that's wonderful, but you need a violin player, you need an oboe player, a piano player, a percussionist. Right? Otherwise, you don't have an orchestra. If you have a football team, you have great athletes, but somebody's got to be a quarterback, a tackle, a tight end, and a safety. It's important that you get those athletes and those musicians into the right seats if you're going to be successful. Emotional intelligence. I'm sure many of you have heard a lot of chatter about emotional intelligence. I personally believe it is underestimated in terms of its importance at a company. For me, emotional intelligence is all about authentic self-expression that creates value. Authentic. People who are, feel, are, feel good about themselves are okay with who they are, right? The, the, the communication piece is that they take that authentic nature and they're able to project it to the world around them. They resonate with and then the last part is about creating value, because if you are doing all these things, you know, and you're not creating value, then really it's not worth it. But when you have people who are authentic, who communicate openly and honestly and effectively with the world around them, and they do so with a focus on creating value, you have something special, a foundation, I think, for success. The next one is diversity. And we talk about ethnic and cultural and gender diversity. They're hugely important. But it's also about intellectual, creative, and experiential diversity as well. We are all collectively smarter than any one of us individually. And the more diversity you have in a company, the better ideas that tend to come about. The last one is 360-degree leadership. You know, I think commonly people think that leadership is vested in the senior management team. I don't believe that. Sure, senior management have leadership responsibilities. But I think that every individual in a company should be given the opportunity to be a leader, which means that they take initiative. They take pride in the job that they do, and they know they're being given the freedom to succeed at that endeavor and that their voice will be heard if they have ideas that will help that operation, that team, that project be better. 
whether you're on the manufacturing line or whether you're the CEO. It's not easy to do, but when you have an entire organization of people who all feel that they can be leaders and they're being asked to honestly to be leaders, they give so, so much more. So that's the people front. The culture front is oftentimes, as I talked about before, the most difficult thing to get right at a company. So these are some of the things that we've been focusing on at Tenet. Other companies may have other things that are important to their culture and to what they're trying to accomplish. All right, but it's the, 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 the philosophy, the principle, I think, is the same. For us, we decided to build our culture around the core value of stewardship. Stewardship for us is all about leaving things in better condition than you found them, no matter what you do, on a day-to-day -day basis, project by project, strategy by strategy. Always check in to make sure you're leaving things in better condition than what you found. The second one is exploration. If you're going to reinvent yourself, you have to build a culture that's comfortable with change, right? You have to let people know it's okay to explore, to be entrepreneurial, to think outside the box, to cry, try crazy ideas, but most important, you have to establish a culture where it is okay to fail. Matter of fact, the tenant, we reward and recognize failure. What we tell people is, listen, you tried something completely new. It didn't work out the way you anticipated. You cut your losses at the appropriate time. You learned a lot. Now take those learnings, get back up on the horse, and ride into the future. If you don't do that, then everybody fears really trying something new because they know they may fail and they're going to get punished for that failure. If that is the culture, I can promise you, you will never get anything better than incremental improvement from your people. But if they understand that really thinking outside the box and taking risks is okay, matter of fact, that's what they expected, that's what's rewarded, they will take that chance. And that relates to one of my favorite quotes, and that is that ships in port are safe, but that's not <laughs> what ships were built for. They were meant to go out and sail the seven seas and explore. And that's what companies are made for too, in my belief. All right, so the next is collaboration. Many companies operate in silos. Right? You have a sales silo, marketing silo, manufacturing silo, North America business silo, European business silo. Right? When you have that, people within those functions or businesses are loyal to the team or the function of the business first and to the company second. So they will maximize the value they're creating within the function and it's oftentimes not beneficial to the company. What you get, politics, bureaucracy, and you don't get a lot of success. The fact is, is that you have widely distributed talents around a company. What you need to figure out is a way to bring that talent together on teams, right, to work on a project or an issue, get it done, and then they disperse. And then other teams are formed with other complements of talents, and on and on and on. If you have a best practice in your North America business that's relevant to your Asia business, you make sure that the North American team send people over to help their Asian colleagues figure it out. Right? This is one of these things where one times one equals five. Because you're leveraging the talent within the organization so much more effectively, and everybody feels that they're part of the company first, and their function or business second. Lastly, engage hearts and minds. Most companies are good at engaging your mind. Right? You come in and you have uh, objectives, you're given tasks, work hard. But if all you do is engage people's mind, you're going to get 70% of their effort. It isn't until you also engage their heart. 
which is all about making them feel that they're important, that they are part of something that's bigger than themselves, that they are excited and motivated by what they're doing, and hugely proud of what the company is trying to accomplish. If you win their hearts, you get 110% of their effort, and that's when really beautiful things happen. And this is one of my favorite stories, and I've told this story for 20 years in my career. And it's a story about two stonecutters. A group of people walk up to the first stonecutter and ask him what he's doing. And he continues to work. He looks up at him and he says, well, you can see I'm just cutting these stones into blocks, which was exactly what he was doing. So then they walk up to the second stonecutter, who's doing exactly the same thing, and they ask him, what are you doing? He stands up, he looks them in the eyes, and he says, I'm on a team that's building a cathedral. We are all stonecutters in our jobs. We all work in finance or marketing and sales in the North America business or the Asian business. But it isn't until you feel like you're on a team that building a cathedral that truly magical things can happen. And they can. Strategy, third piece. First one is dream big. I mean, my, my judgment is if you're going to work your butt off anyway, you might as well try to accomplish something great, right? To work your butt off for mediocrity, that doesn't seem too interesting to me. The other thing I know is that if you dream big, you may not realize every part of that dream, but I promise you that you will end up in a much, much better place than if you had tried a mediocre undertaking. And here's another quote by the famous ad man, Leo Burnett, that says, when you reach for the stars, you may not always get one, but you won't come up with a handful of mud either. And it's very true. Define the right outcomes. Define the right outcomes and manage from the future. Right? Plant a flag five or ten years out, right? and set an objective as to what you want to become and let that influence your every decision. So that from day one, you can validate that you're actually moving in the right direction toward that, because you know where you're trying to go. See, most companies don't do that. They don't look that far out because it's so uncertain. But it's important to manage from the future and set the right outcome. The most famous example, I think, in history, maybe, of this was John F. Kennedy's speech about going to the moon. In 1960, he said, we're going to put a man on the moon and bring him back. 1960, the technology did not exist for that to happen, right? He had no clue whether it was technically feasible, but he thought it was possible, and he felt that if he established that as an outcome, the U.S., at a minimum, would develop some truly awesome technologies that would help the, company, the country advance. At best, they'd actually achieve it. And of course, as we all know, they did. The third one is current game and new game. Great companies are adept at playing the current game better and simultaneously playing new games, continuously. You have to have this balance. If you're a conservative company, you know, risk averse, all you focus on is playing the current game better, right? Because that's what you're comfortable with, the future and outside the box, don't know about that. And you get incremental improvement at best, right? Then you got the, the people on the other end of the spectrum who are maybe too entrepreneurial, a little crazy, and they are excited about chasing every shiny object they see out there. Oh, look at that idea. It's wonderful. Let's go get it and they tend to forget the business that got them there, right? And what happens is that business starts to deteriorate. Of course, that's the business that was going to fund the new ideas should they ever materialize, and they end up in real trouble. So this balance between current game and new game is something that you have to monitor continuously to make sure you got it right. It makes life complex because you're juggling a lot of balls but it is the best way to truly migrate to a new game 
and a new future effectively. And then finally, constantly adapt and adjust. I mean, my, my judgment is the only constant in life is change. Just look at the last four or five years, right? I mean, there's always going to be geopolitical change. There's going to be change within our industry. Technologies are changing at a rapid pace. Customer uh, requirements and needs always change. So if you stick to your, you know, your, the old ways that, that, that worked for you in the past, um, stubbornly, you will most likely not uh, succeed to the highest level of your ability. The need and the ability to adapt and adjust is critical. All right? People, culture, strategy. The three need to be connected. And when they are, beautiful things can happen. So, let me tell you the tenant innovation story and how we have used some of these principles. I think you're going to find this pretty interesting. All right, so what did we do in terms of defining the right outcomes? In 2002, when I arrived, we described ourselves as a non-residential floor maintenance company. Boring. That year was the first year we used sustainability as a strategic filter in our new product development process. We also planted a flag five plus years out and said, you know, we want to be an environmental cleaning solutions company. Environmental cleaning solutions company. People looked at me like I was nuts. Right? But then I said, that's what we're going to become. And we're going to start the journey there today. The key is, get started. People would come to me and say, what does environmental cleaning solution company actually mean? And what are we going to look like when we get there? And how do I take the first step? What do I do tomorrow? And I look at them and I say, I don't know. I really don't know. Right? All I know is that we're heading west. Right? And if I catch you going north, east, or south, I'm going to grab you by the scruff of the neck and I am going to push you west. What I can't tell you is if we're going to take the northern route or the south southern route. I don't know if we're going to end up in Vancouver or in San Diego. But let's get the journey started, and each year of that journey, we will be more informed, and we'll figure out, first of all, whether we're taking the northern or southern route, and whether we end up in Vancouver or in San Diego. But what I can tell you, that in five years from now, tenant will be a very different and a much better company. Let's get started. We were very thoughtful about playing the new games and, uh, or current game and new game better, right? Because I said that balance is key. If you're going to reinvent yourself, you've got to take care of the core. So what we did in the beginning, we said, okay, we're going to run the business in two buckets, right? And from a strategic perspective, we're going to have the run the business better bucket and we're going to have the grow the business better. And we're going to have a balanced portfolio of strategies and initiatives under each, right? The run the business better was all about the core. And if you look at it, two out of the three strategies under grow were also about our existing business, products and solutions in our core business and expanding markets again with our core business. Only the new technologies piece was all around the new game, right? So we felt the company understood that and we were applying resources appropriately. It was clear that the capabilities and the culture that got us to where we were were not going to get us to where we were going, right? They needed to be very, very different. So what did we do? We did a very, very comprehensive leadership assessment process. It, in, in total, probably took us, by the time we finished, two years to get through this. But we needed the right leaders for the right jobs. Not the right jobs of yesterday, the right jobs of the future. We had to figure out what competencies we were looking at. We used industrial psychologists. We put individuals and teams through fairly grueling assessments. We partnered with recruiting agencies to see what kind of talent we would be able to, to recruit. Right? We did a thorough job figuring out exactly what it was we needed in terms of people and talent to give us a chance of accessing this bright new future of becoming an environmental cleaning solutions company. What happened? 
Well, if you look at where we were in the 2000 to 2002 period, right, we evaluated our current organization, right, transformational, complement, or, uh, competent, or inadequate. Well, that didn't look too good. If we were really going to change, we weren't going to change with that complement of talent, right? Where, you know, the, the transformational folks were in the minority. We changed out over those years 65 out of the top 100 executives at Tenet, and many more below them. What you learn if you're truly going to change a company and a culture is that you're going to have to bring new blood in. There are many people, and the vast majority of people at Tenet stayed, of course. But you need this critical mass of new blood, new thinking. People who have no vested interest in the past, only a belief that the future that's been identified, becoming an environmental cleaning solutions company, is possible. And you know what happens? That critical mass starts to grow, and they influence the rest of the organization. The culture that they bring in eventually becomes the culture of the overall company. The other thing we learned was we had to shift our thinking from more from a, a research and development standpoint, right? We, we were a 143-year-old company that knew how to make scrubbers and sweepers. And if we wanted to become an environmental cleaning solutions company, we were going to have to start thinking about how do you use less water? Can you create cleaning uh, um, machines that use no chemicals but still clean just as well? Right? What are all the new technologies or emerging technologies out there that we need to access to potentially you know, uh, help us get to where we're trying to go? So you know, we, had, we had to shift out mechanical engineers for, for electrical engineers. Um, we had to beef up our advanced product development department that had a skimpy budget, and we gave them a much larger share of the research and development budget, and we told them, your job is to go out into the world and scour the world for new and emerging technologies that we can adapt to our business. This, again, took some time. The thing you learn in this process is that if you want to reinvent yourself, <laughs> you've got to be patient, because it never happens as fast as you would like. To change a culture, to change a company, to really access a new strategy takes time, right? So you, you don't want to give up. You just got to be patient and see that you're actually having some sh short-term wins. Because the short-term wins give you some confidence that you're going in the right direction. We had two short-term wins in the first couple of years. The first one was fast foam act activated scrubbing technology. We figured out a different chemical formulation which required our, op our customers to use less chemical and quite a bit less water in the cleaning process, a step towards sustainability. And it was quite uh, successful in the marketplace, incrementally, but still successful. Ready space, we figured out, a, this is about a carpet care. When our customers had to deep clean their carpets, they had to put huge amounts of water down. So if you were a hotel and you had a conference center, you cleaned uh, the, the rug, you had to leave it uh, closed for 24 hours before you could let anybody in. That was lost revenue. Same in the rooms. So this technology used much less water, a different cleaning uh, um, mechanism, uh, and it allowed the carpet to dry in 20 minutes or less. So you could clean the facility at 6 and have guests come in at 7. Right? So it was a big performance enhancer for our customers, used less water. That was also big. So we started making some progress. It felt good. But then in 2006, we had the breakthrough. Bruce Field, our mad scientist, matter of fact, a guy who was just recognized uh, a little while ago as uh, the Minnesota, one of the Minnesotans to hold the most patents in the state. He's an amazing human being. And he is a little bit of a mad scientist. But you need that because these are the people who make uh, uh, unusual connections and are willing to think outside the box. On a trip to Japan, he discovered water electrolysis. He found two niche companies that were electrolyzing water, right, to create a cleaning and sanitizing solution. One of the companies was using it to sanitize and clean vegetables, 
and the other one was using it for medical instrument cleaning and wound care. Electrolysis of water has been around for 30 years, but it's not used much. Bruce said, hmm, I know nobody's using this in our industry, so he took this back to Minnesota. He worked in his lab for about six months, and then he came to me and he said, I think I really have something here. And lo and behold, in 2008, Tennant introduces ECH2O, electrically converted water technology. Now, what is this? Bruce figured out a way to create a water cell that we could put into our uh, scrubbers. Right? The easy water technology electrically converts plain tap water, converting it into an innovative and effective cleaning solution that cleans as well, and in many instances, better than chemicals. It's a win on many customer fronts. Right? It eliminates the need for chemicals. It saves them money. It simplifies the cleaning process because the operators don't have to mix the chemicals anymore. Right? It, it's safer for the operators to use. And it leaves behind almost no environmental footprint because what happens is after 45 seconds, the cleaning solution reverts back into plain tap water and dirt and can be put down any drain in a complete inert fashion. And the other beautiful thing, this cleaning methodology uses 70% less water than normal cleaning methods that are used around the world in our industry. Right? This, we, we knew we were on to something big. We also knew that people looked at us like we were crazy. They thought this was hocus pocus. You can electrolyze water to create a cleaning solution that cleans as well as chemicals. There's no way. So we knew we had to get out there and get external recognition and validation, right? Because it's one thing for us to tell people that it works. It's another thing when authorities that people know and respect tell them that it works. So we won, we won a lot of awards. We got a lot of recognition. I'll just point out two. R&D Magazine in 2009 named EC Water as one of the 100 most important new innovations in the world that year. The Apple iPhone was on that list too. Right? So then people said, hmm, maybe this is for real. Here in Minnesota, we won a Techni Award. We won the, the Clean Tech Award for Innovation in 2010 with EC Water. And then customers started to say, you know, let's give it a try because it looks like it's real. And importantly, our employees were breathing a sigh of relief saying, wow, this maybe is for real. Let's go after it and get it. At the same time, Harvard Business School came to us and said, we, we're, we hear about you. This is fascinating. We'd like to do a case study. So they did a case study on Tenant. You see the title there. They were obviously interested in what we were trying to do, bring a disruptive technology to the industry to try to, to ch completely change the status quo but they were equally interested in the fact that it was a 140-year-old Midwestern industrial company that was in the midst of reinventing itself. Now remember, this case study was written in the middle of the recession when everybody was talking about the new normal and that everybody was going to have to re reinvent themselves and they're going to be successful in the future. And they said, if Tenant can do it, this bodes well for American industry because then almost any company should be able to do it. Now, the recognition we got from this was awesome, but better than that, through Harvard, the contacts and connections that we made that have helped us move this technology and this business forward have been absolutely amazing. So that's a learning, is, you know, you can't do it all yourself. Reach out and find people who can help you. So how did we do? After a slow start, we, uh, you know, and we launched this into the middle, into the teeth of the recession in 2008. May of 2008, slow start, slow adoption, it started to build. By the end of, la of 2011, we had a $140 million business and something that hadn't existed before 2008. How has competition responded, right? That's important. I show this chart because it's interesting. When Henry Ford introduced the Model T, if you had asked customers, you know, who had horse and buggies what they wanted, they would have told you, we need a faster horse. 
That's what they would have told you. Well, Henry Ford decided to change the game, and he's credited with totally transforming personal transportation globally since then. This is a little bit similar to where we find ourselves. We are trying to change the game in our industry with EC Water technology. Whatever competitors done, they continue to try to make their horse faster. They have not launched a product that's comp that, that, that competes with EC Water. What they have done, and this is the arrows, is that they've decided to, at to attack us legally in the US, England, Belgium, and Germany. And they say that the, that the technology doesn't work and that we're misleading our customers. So far, we've won two judgments in the US and in the UK. Uh, the German one is pending, and the Belgians have said they'll, they'll, they'll agree to whatever the Germans decide. But so far, it has had no impact on our business, but it has been a backhanded compliment, and it has created huge publicity for us, because people say that if the competition's willing to go to this length, nobody's ever sued anybody in our industry, then Tenant must truly be onto something with this technology. And our people were worried during this time because all these legal actions, customers questioning us. But I, I went around the company and I used an old Gandhi quote, because Gandhi was a disruptor in his own way, right? He was a social and political disruptor. But Gandhi was fond of saying that when you're doing something truly different, first they ignore you, then they ridicule you, and then they fight you, which is what they were finally doing with the legal the lawsuits, and then you win. And there was no question in mind in our minds that we were going to win. We realized at this time that we were into something big. We had stepped into something big, and it was completely different from our core business. The other thing that was beautiful is that we felt strongly that sustainability was an emerging megatrend. Just look at the number of S&P 500 companies that published corporate responsibility and sustainability reports in 2011 versus 2008. In 2000, I can promise you, it was zero. Nobody did it. So this was an emerging trend, and we could show our customers. Ecoform, which is an independent environmental technical analysis firm, showed that with cleaning with EC water versus conventional chemicals, you reduce the environmental impact of the cleaning process between 77 and 98%. That was compelling. Because you think that customers like a Walmart that have maybe 30,000 tenant machines in their portfolio, and you can reduce the environmental impact of each machine by this much, and then you add it up, it's big. We kept dabbling with the technology in our labs, and we realized this was just the tip of the iceberg. What we had was a technology platform, right? We could manipulate the technology in the labs so that it would clean, it would sanitize, and it would disinfect. Matter of fact, we can get it to disinfect at a hospital grade level and even beyond that, which could open huge new markets for us. Right? So we said, wow. What do we do? If we try to develop this technology platform within the mothership of Tenant, a 143-year-old company, we're going to fail, right? Because the status quo will take over and it will kill the new idea. So what did we do? We decided that we were going to take some of our best and brightest people. And it's led by Carla Lease, who sits in the middle there. She was our VP of international marketing at the time. Took some of our best and brightest people and we said, you are now a startup, okay? Go and find yourself a glorified garage somewhere and you're going to start focusing 24-7 on figuring out how we leverage this technology in as many markets and applications as possible. We realized that we couldn't brand this tenant. Tenant was known for scrubbers and sweepers. It's another learning, right? You know, brands represent certain products and certain products represent brands. You've got to be very careful with that. The other thing was, this was a technology, it wasn't actually a cleaning product. It's a little bit like Intel inside. You know, you could have this technology inside a whole host of cleaning devices. Ones that we make and ones that we may license to others. So we decided 
to name the technology Orbio Technologies, and the team became the Orbio Technologies Group. And they, their mandate was basically to set the standard for sustainable cleaning around the world and to find new markets and new applications. They worked on this for a little bit, they, 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 and they formed in 2010. Okay? They worked on this a little bit, and they came back to me, and I said, my God, there's overwhelming opportunity. This is a chart that shows the amount of cleaning chemicals that are used in the United States alone on an annual basis, just in the United States. So that's the way we try to measure what the impact could be, because what we're doing is, is disintermediating all chemicals, sanitizing chemicals and, and disinfectants potentially over time. So we said, well, we're going to have to focus. You can't do all this. You're a startup. You've got to focus. So we said, we're going to do this in three phases. First phase was closest in. Put the technology on all our existing core products for which it is relevant. And we've done that on all of our, our floor cleaning devices. And we're trying to figure out how to adapt it to our carpet care devices as well. Second phase, figure out how we can clean more of our customer spaces in more environmentally friendly ways. Meaning go to our existing customers who already have bought into EC Water and figure out how we can develop a portfolio of cleaning devices that clean all, if not all, most of their environment, their facilities, in more sustainable ways. Eventually cleaning, sanitizing, and disinfecting. And we have a product in the market that I'm going to talk about that's in phase two. And then the third phase, which is maybe the, mo the biggest idea of all, but the furthest away from what Tenet has done historically, are new markets and applications, healthcare, food processing, and the whole world of the consumer. We're just exploring here right now, but clearly if we ever enter these markets, they're so far away from what we do that we're most likely going to have to partner uh, to get uh, the technology and the products into those markets. But some of the preliminary testing we've done in all three shows great promise. So, the beginning of the future, the first Orbio product, they launched their first product within 18 months of forming as a team. The Orbio 5000 SC is an innovative dispensing device, it uses Orbio technology, right? So it takes tap water, electricity, and plain water softener salt to create an environmentally friendly, multi-purpose cleaning solution that eliminates the need for almost all our customers cleaning chemicals, except for their disinfectants that they use in the bathroom, because this device only has the cleaning element in it. We're still working to perfect the sanitizing and the disinfecting. Right? It creates it on site and on demand. And for the first time, we get off the floor, because you can fill scrubbers to clean floors and carpet extractors for carpets, but you can also Put this in buckets and in spray bottles and clean just about every, any surface. Windows, metal surfaces, ceramic surfaces, wood surfaces. What people tell us that use this, for example, in hospitality, maids, they tend to have um, you know, uh, respiratory issues. Why do they have those respiratory issues? Because they're spraying chemicals in the rooms day in and day out, and it affects them. They've used this technology for six months, we come back and they say, it's a miracle. We no longer have any respiratory issues, right? Which the, the hotel loves because it reduces their medical claims too. So it has an ancillary benefit. So, as I said, this is cleaning. We are going to be developing devices that sanitize and disinfect. They can clean and sanitize, clean and disinfect, any combination. Um, so we have a, a rich product development pipeline going forward. But where are we on this? Just like with EC Water in the beginning, it's going slower than what we anticipated to get traction. We know that where we have placed the units and where the customers have used it for at least six months, the performance is great and they absolutely love it and they would never go back. That tells us that this is, we're onto something. But we got to figure out a business model to get better and better traction. This is not surprising, by the way. If you ever are involved with disruptive technology of any kind, and it takes a while to get traction, it is the norm. Because the fact is, this, this is what people will tell you about disruptive technologies. If you went to Steve Jobs or, 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 um, or um, Bill Gates 
they would say this too, based on their experience. That with disruptive technology, people tend to always overestimate what's possible in the short term and underestimate the potential in the long term. And so they often give up right before they're going to break through. Right? The fact is that commercializing disruptive technology is hard. If it wasn't hard, somebody would already have done it because what you're doing, I mean, the fact is you have no model of success. You're venturing into uncharted territory. You're making it up as you go, right? And you have to change people's behavior, which is not easy, as we all know in our private lives. You've got to change their behaviors, and you have to upend the status quo of an industry, which is also not easy, right? But when disruptive technologies do break through, they often do change an industry, and they create tremendous value for the company that introduced them. And that's what we're th we think we're on to. So I run around the company all the time telling people, don't give up. The prize is there. Yes, there's some risk. It's fraught with a little bit of danger, right? But we, you know, we'll put on the protective gear, and we'll keep going out there and fighting the good fight, and eventually we will break through. We will break through. So, with all this, how have our financial results been to date? Well, you looked at, you saw what it was beforehand. We've done a lot better, but remember, these results include two absolutely awful recession years. So even with those years in there, this is the performance, and this is compounded annual growth rates. Right? And the best is yet to come. The best is yet to come. So, we find ourselves at an important juncture yet again. And yes, we are revisiting our people, culture, strategy, framework today as we speak to ensure that we have it right for what we're trying to accomplish on the next leg of this journey. And yes, we find ourselves going west yet again, but this time in a much more high-tech 21st century fashion. We're exploring new space. I'm not sure where all this is going to end up, but I know again that we will be a very different company five years from now, and that the journey is going to be a very interesting one. And I think that we will go a long way toward fulfilling Tenant's promise, the promise that attracted me when I started in 2002, of helping the world to become a cleaner, safer, and healthier place. Thank you. So the question is, how do we manage our, our owners, our investors? Right, who have this intense focus on quarterly results uh, versus you know, what we're trying to do here, which is reinvent ourselves and create a completely new business. Um, the answer to that goes back to uh, one of the things I talked about, the new game, or the current game versus the new game idea. Right? That's why you have to continue to play the current game better, because the current game is what's going to give you you know, the, the short-term earnings that hopefully uh, uh, satisfy your investors and they're intrigued by the long-term potential. But if you don't deliver the short-term results, right, they're not going to give you the right to go after the long-term potential. So you have to do both. And it's difficult. It's very difficult. Um, but it's the only way I know of making it happen. Now, if you look at tenant, what's interesting is that our price earnings multiple is much higher than our industrial peer group, right? And that's not because of the results we're generating today. It's because of the promise of the results that we can generate in the future and that they see we're truly trying to do something different.
I wonder if you can say more about the impact on the culture when you do this uh, leadership review. So if last time 65% of top leaders got changed over and you're heading into it again, how do you make that a healthy process? So the question is around, you know, this, uh, you know when you talk about the, the culture and the changing of people and the impact it has, and now that we're you know, at a position where we're evaluating our people culture strategy again, you know, how, how is it going to work? Well, let me, let me answer it in two ways. One, if you go back to when we did it the first time, obviously it was very difficult, right, for a lot of people. Um, and so all you can do is that you ensure that uh, you continue to communicate what you're trying to accomplish, what the future can hold. And remember, the majority of people at Tenant stayed, right? So you've got to keep them engaged. Um, and then you treat the people that leave with ultimate respect. And you bend over backwards to make their exit as good or better than what they anticipated because they deserve that. Uh, if you do that, you know, it's, it's, it's amazing. You often make your rep rep reputation as a company and as a leadership team based on the way you treat people on the way out. The rest of the organization looks at that very carefully because it says a lot about you. It's easy to be nice when things are good. It's a lot tougher to be nice, fair, and reasonable when things are tough. So we focused on that a lot. And it worked out pretty well. Now, I mean, I'm not sure exactly. You know, we're in the early stages of figuring out again. I don't think we're going to have anywhere near the disruption we did back in, uh, you know, in the 2004 to 2006 period of time. I think it's going to be more tweaking uh, of, uh, of the people and the capabilities. But clearly, we need some different capabilities. Uh, as we go forward. What we're also realizing is maybe we don't need to build those capabilities internally within Tenant, but we got to figure out how we can build an ecosystem of partnerships that can help us with those capabilities. Because we can't do all this on our own. We, you know, I mentioned you know, the, 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 you know, the third phase of our development plans where we're going into healthcare and food processing in the consumer market. We're going to do that through partnerships. So hopefully a lot of the new capabilities we need will come through those partnerships. Yes? Well, I'll, I'll repeat the question. So then. Well, I mean, that's, I don't think we're good, as good as we need to be yet. We're much, much better than we were. Uh, I mean, I, I'm personally invested in it, and I get around and speak to various parts of the organization as often as I can. Um, we have done, uh, it, it, we, we, we require and have done some training of our managers around the world, because what you find is, is that company, employees often find that corporate communications are okay, right? They get that, but that the, the, their managers are never good enough at communicating the corporate message in a way that is, is understandable to the individuals who work on their team. That seems to be the roadblock. So that's really where we're focusing our attention, is getting our managers to understand that we're holding them accountable uh, to communicate really well, and that uh, we're watching them, and we're giving them the training necessary to make that happen. Um, so, getting better, but not good enough. The other thing that we've done is, we have uh, um, we've we've created all kinds of recognition programs in in the company, so that we we're always scouring people who are doing the you know doing something amazing that's completely consistent with what we're trying to accomplish, and we make sure that we celebrate them and that people get to see that. And they, because that's modeling behaviors. And that's a powerful tool within a company too. When peers see somebody get recognized for a certain behavior, they figure that may be something I need to try or I need to learn. And we've been much better at using tenant intranet uh, in terms of, of creating messaging uh, you know, and that we update all the time uh, about uh, where we're going and what we're doing. But it's a work in progress. You know, the communication piece, that's a really good point. You know, the, 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 
research has been done on companies and they look at why they, they have hard times sometimes with, uh, with people culture strategy and they say, you know, one of the factors is that they tend to under-communicate, under-communicate by a factor of 10, right? So what my philosophy is is that, you know, you have to repeat and repeat and repeat in the, mes the message until you are so sick and tired of hearing your own voice. It's only when you feel like that, you look out in the audience and eyes start to open up and they say, oh, that's what you're talking about, right? You've got to stick with it over time. Yes? Well, well, you know, when we, when we, you know, when people try something uh, that's out of the ordinary, uh, outside the box, and it doesn't work, we make sure that story gets told broadly, right? So that's a story we we tell, and uh, like I said, we celebrate and recognize that failure, and then we just, we talk about, okay, you know, they did something great, exactly what we wanted them to do. It didn't work out. They've learned from it, right? They're going to use those learnings, but we're we're telling them to get back up on the horse and ride into the future again. You know, if you do that enough and you communicate those stories broadly in the organization, people start to get it, right? But it, not overnight. And there's still parts of the organization that are a little bit fearful, right? But there are other parts that have, uh, you know, are, are going out there with reckless abandon. Matter of fact, we're having to rein them in a little bit so that they don't go too crazy. So, so the quest, first question is, you know, how's it going having uh, the Orbio Technologies group as a separate group away from the mothership of Tenet? Um, you know, I, I think generally speaking, it's going pretty well because they're working on some really interesting stuff, thank goodness, because that way all other parts of the organization are extremely curious about what they're doing and want to get involved. So they're able to, to draw on resources from Tenet uh, you know, pretty easily and effectively, and, uh, and so they haven't had to go out and get those resources themselves. So people raise their hand to go help Orbio if they, if they get a chance. Your second question was about leadership succession, right? I mean, that's something that uh, we work on every year uh, as a management team, but also with the board, you know, and it's, it's harder when you're a smaller company like Tenant, where you don't have huge bench, bench strength, you know, if you're a GE, you know, you probably have 20 people in each position that you could look at as a potential successor. A tenant, you may have one, right? So you've got to make sure that one is right. I'd say today we've been, you know, I would say that maybe 60% of our key positions in the organization have a successor. 40% uh, don't. But um, we, we had almost no succession. Uh, four years ago, so we've made a lot of progress, and we'll continue to make progress on that. But that is always at the, you know, uh, the forefront uh, of my priority list. Mr. Killingstad, would you say a word about your professional journey that brought you to this uh, position at Tenant? Tell us a little bit about your background. Uh, how I well, first of all, you got to understand, as, as Barbara said, you know, I I grew up overseas. I was born in New York, uh, but I, I lived in Europe, uh, the Middle East, and Asia. Um, you know, I was actually in Beirut, Lebanon during the 1967 Middle East War and was evacuated. And uh, you know, we saw people get killed, and it was, uh, you know, it was pretty horrible. But that, you know, those are the type of, of experience I've had. So I've always been comfortable in these very foreign environments where things are done completely differently. So I've never assumed that there's only one way to do something, which is really important in terms of how I think, that I am adaptable and flexible. I would say that the most important uh, uh, opportunity I was given in my career was in 1990. I was working for Pepsi, 
and uh, a former Pepsi executive had gone to haagen Ice Cream, which was a subsidiary of Pillsbury at the time, but runs separately in Teaneck, New Jersey. haagen was a successful brand in the U.S., but it had no international presence. And the goal was to make it a global brand, take it internationally. So uh, he came to me, um, and it's actually, his name is John Riccatello, and he's actually now the president and CEO of Electronic Arts. But uh, John came to me and he said, uh, Chris, okay, I'll give you an opportunity. You can either go to Asia to start the haagen business or you can go to Europe. I'll let you choose. And, uh, and I, you know, I said, I'll take, I'll take Asia. It sounds more, more interesting. So I went to Asia uh, where Pillsbury nor haagen had any people, infrastructure, resources, nothing. I rented office space by the month at the Hong Kong American Center. I, we, we, we lived in Hong Kong. I knocked on the doors at the American Embassy in, uh, in, in Japan, in Taiwan, in Korea, and said, who can I talk to about starting a business in these countries? I paid the bills on my personal credit card for the first three months because Pillsbury couldn't figure out how to set up a bank account. They hadn't operated in Asia, really, at that point. And from those humble beginnings, and believe me, I was nervous and scared and had absolutely no clue what I was doing. Um, we built a $500 million business in six years in ice cream, right? Because we did things, we, we innovated within ice cream. And the haagen image in international markets is one of luxury, right? It's one of sensual pleasure. It is, we, in, in, in Tokyo or even in uh, Shanghai and in Beijing, we charge $8 or more a pint. Right? There we established haagen cafes where you have the waiters in, in tuxedos with elaborate dessert menus in sumptuous surroundings right? that also reflected the brand. That experience gave me, I think, the courage to say, you know, you can do some things differently. So, when I, so it, it changed my mind in terms of what's possible. And I took that to tenant. And as I said, I took on the creative and intellectual challenge of how to take a 140-year-old business that was in non-residential floor maintenance and, and, and try to transform it. We're in the middle of the journey to an environmental cleaning solutions company. So, yeah. Thank you very, very much for inspiring us this evening to just keep going. That was just a fascinating story, right. and we're so pleased that you could be at Augsburg College. We'd like to invest you as an honorary Augie by offering you this uh, Augsburg Wonderful. sweatshirt. I accept. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.